for logging in this morning. My name is Kevin Weiss. As you heard, I am an author and a photographer. So I'll be showing you a lot of pictures I've taken over about the last 25 years. One of the books I've written is called Jersey Shore History and Facts. And I'll tell you about some others at the end of the program. But what I'd like to do for about the next hour is take you on a little trip through time and also a journey along the Jersey Shore. About 127 miles of islands and beaches. And to keep things really simple, we're just starting in the north and working our way down. So we'll be starting back in 1764. That was the year the merchants of New York City held two lotteries to raise money to build a lighthouse to guide ships into the harbor. They built the light here in New Jersey at Sandy Hook, and they built it to last. During the American Revolution, which began just a few years later, the colonists wanted to disrupt British shipping in and out of New York. One of the ways they tried to do that was by firing their cannons at this lighthouse. Luckily, those stone walls are about 10 feet thick at the base, so the cannonballs just bounced right off. The tower survived and is the oldest lighthouse still in operation in the United States. These days, they have a 1,000-watt light bulb up at the top, shining 24 hours a day. The light is focused by an antique lens that was installed in the 1850s. Things have changed. When the lighthouse was first built, the lighting apparatus consisted of about four dozen wicks floating in two pans of oil. When things get back to normal, the tower is regularly open for tours as part of the Gateway National Recreation Area. That's run by the National Park Service, also includes parks on Long Island and Staten Island. But until the National Park Service took over in 1974, most of Sandy Hook was closed to the public. It was owned by the federal government, but reserved for military use. Up around the lighthouse, you can still see the barracks and officers' houses of Fort Hancock that was built in the 1890s to protect the approaches to New York. During both world wars, gun batteries were manned at Sandy Hook to defend in case an enemy fleet crossed the Atlantic. And again, they usually offer occasional tours and demonstrations of some of the batteries and other buildings. When I took this picture, I guess about eight or ten years ago, they were showing how quickly one of those World War II coastal defense guns could be reloaded. It took less than 15 seconds. Of course, with the 1950s, the arrival of the Cold War, it was no longer a fleet crossing the Atlantic they were concerned about. It was the possibility of Soviet bombers flying in over the North Pole. And that's when they installed Nike anti-aircraft missile bases at Sandy Hook. And be glad these things were never needed, for several reasons. The later models, like this Nike Hercules, were designed to carry nuclear warheads. The missile bases were closed down in the early 1970s. So the only part of Sandy Hook that had been open to the public was the little town of Highland Beach at the south end. And Highland Beach had swimming beaches on both the Atlantic Ocean and the Shrewsbury River. The town no longer exists. The state bought and demolished it in the early 1960s for a short-lived state park that was later rolled into the national park. Today it's where the park entrance and the southernmost lot, parking lots are located. From the beach on the bay, you get a good look at the Navisink Twin Lights. They're not very tall lighthouses, but they don't have to be. They stand on top of a 200-foot hill, so they could be seen up to 25 miles at sea. And the, gov the government built the unusual double lighthouse tower so that nobody could confuse this signal with the Sandy Hook light just a few miles away to the north. The South Tower used to have a giant rotating lens that produced a flashing light. Because it's no longer in use, that lens is displayed in a smaller building behind the lighthouse. This used to be the station's electrical generating plant. And despite their nickname, the Twin Lights, they're not really twins. That South Tower is square, and the North one, well, that's octagonal. If there was ever a reason for that, the only person who knew about it was the architect, and he never explained. But the North Tower, they do keep a lantern at the top. It is lit every night. And when the museum, which is located in the brownstone building connecting the towers, that used to be housing for four light keepers, when that reopens, the North Tower will probably be open again to visitors. There is a spiral stairway there you can climb to the top. Heading south from Sandy Hook or the Twin Lights, a few miles down the road you might spot a large red windmill. 
It was actually built in the 1960s as a hot dog and hamburger stand. I believe it's still in operation. Uh, I've eaten there a few times over the years. But I show it because it's one of the more familiar landmarks in the city of Long Branch. And Long Branch has a long history. It's one of the shore's earliest resorts, known for a high sandy bluff that long ago eroded away, for large hotels and fashionable visitors. Part of what made Long Branch so popular is that it was easy to get to from New York. In the 1860s, you could take a steamship from Manhattan, you would dock near Sandy Hook, and then it was just a short ride on the railroad into Long Branch. Some of those steamships also served the resorts along Raritan Bay, including Keensburg, where I took this picture. The trip to Long Branch had gotten even easier by the 1880s, when the city had an ocean pier 800 feet long. The ships would tie up at the pier, visitors could walk directly from the ship to their hotel. There is no longer a pier in Long Branch. The last one was destroyed by a fire in the 1980s, but the modern oceanfront development of shops and restaurants and apartments is still called Pier Village. It was also in the late 1800s that Long Branch earned a nickname. It became known as our Summer Capital. The story, though, begins in the early 1860s, when the First Lady of the United States, Mary Todd Lincoln, spent a few weeks in Long Branch. When she got back to Washington, D.C., she told everybody she knew there what a great town this was, how much she had enjoyed her visit. And if you've ever spent time in the nation's capital during the summer, you know how hot and humid it gets there. So people that worked for the government began spending part of their summers up in Long Branch. And in 1869, the president himself arrived. Ulysses S. Grant liked the town so much he would make it his summer home for the rest of his life. While he was president, he did all of his work, reading, writing, even holding meetings, on the front porch of a rented cottage overlooking the beach and the ocean. In his spare time, he liked to ride his carriage on the beach, sometimes a little too fast. He played cards with his friends, and when they started horse racing nearby at Monmouth Park, he would go to watch the races. They soon had so many people showing up just hoping for a glimpse of the president, the owners put a statue of him right outside the gate. Well, Grant was the first of seven presidents to summer in Long Branch. Following him, you had Rutherford Hayes, James Garfield, Chester Arthur, Benjamin Harrison, William McKinley, and the last president to summer in Long Branch was a former New Jersey governor. Woodrow Wilson ran his 1916 presidential re-election campaign from a suite of offices above a bank in Asbury Park. Spent the summer at an estate called Shadow Lawn. That house burned down a few years later. The building that replaced it was known for many years as Wilson Hall. They're now referring to it as the Great Hall at Shadow Lawn. And it's the main building at Monmouth University. It also doubled in the 1980s as Daddy Warbuck's Mansion in the film version of the Broadway musical Annie. Incredibly, none of the houses or hotels these presidents stayed at are still standing. The only building they st all visited that you can still see is the former St. James Chapel out on Ocean Avenue. And this was nicknamed the Church of the Presidents because they all attended services there. It was later converted to a historical museum, but has now been closed for renovations for quite a long time. Also in Long Branch, you'll find this statue of President Garfield looking out to sea. He died in Long Branch in September 1881, a few months after being shot in Washington. His doctors thought that the fresh ocean air on the Jersey Shore might help him to recover. Well, the fact that the presidents were staying there probably tells you that for much of its early history, Long Branch catered to very wealthy or powerful visitors. But about 1870, another resort was started a few miles to the south with a little bit different idea. Ocean Grove started out as a Methodist camp meeting and those blue laws you might remember. Not being able to drive in town on a Sunday? Well, they go back way before the automobile. Late 1800s, you went to Ocean Grove on a Sunday. Your horse and carriage had to stay outside of town. I guess it's easier to enforce laws like that when you're separated from the neighboring towns by, by lakes. Just close the bridges. When Ocean Grove started out, it was just a tent colony, and there were still about a hundred tents in town. Many of those have been used by the same families for generations. They're gathered near the Great Auditorium. It was built in the center of town in 1894, 
to seat about 9,000 people. And although it's built entirely of wood, it was so well designed that there's not a single interior column to block anybody's views. They did have to extend the front of the building a little bit in 1908, but that was just to make room for what was then the world's largest pipe organ. 8,000 pipes. I was, in, I was in Ocean Grove a few years ago, weekday morning. They had the auditorium doors open while the organist was rehearsing, and you went and listen for a while. If you get the opportunity, that is one incredible instrument. One of the people who really liked Ocean Grove when it was just getting started was a factory owner out of New York. He ran a brush factory. His name was James Bradley, and he leased himself two lots in town, but then decided he wanted to protect the grove. He didn't want a noisy resort next door with amusement park rides. He didn't want the drinking and dancing and gambling a few miles up the road in Long Branch, so he bought the property just north of town, about 500 acres to begin with. So overgrown, he had to cut a path to the beach with a machete, but the work would pay off. He named his new town after the first Methodist bishop in the United States, Francis Asbury. This guy was actually a latecomer to Asbury Park. They call him Tilly because he's modeled after the early 20th century logo of Coney Island entrepreneur George Tillyu, who supposedly modeled it after his brother. George Tillyu built the steeplechase amusement parks, one in Coney Island, one near Bridgeport, Connecticut, one in Atlantic City, and one in Asbury Park. That one opened in 1913. The Asbury steeplechase burned down in 1940 and was never rebuilt. So, mid-1950s, their old rival, Palace Amusements, has new owners, and the new owners are expanding, and they want to decorate the outside of their building with something to remind people of the good old days before the war, before the Depression. So they sort of copied Tillyu's old logo. After Palace Amusements was demolished in 2004, the owners of a place called The Wonder Bar painted them on their sign, and you still see them on merchandise all around the city. But Bradley had wanted to keep the town very quiet and refined, and he was a bit eccentric. He had signs up along the beach and the boardwalk telling you what you could and couldn't do, what you had to wear, and a lot of the other business people were starting to feel like Bradley was holding them back. They wanted to turn Asbury Park into the Atlantic City of the North. So in 1903, they convinced him to sell all of his property, which at that time still included the beach, the boardwalk, and the boardwalk pavilions. After selling the property, Bradley left Asbury Park. I suppose he could have retired, but he had other plans. He had also bought some property south of Ocean Grove, so he spent his last years developing a second resort there, and he named that one after himself. It's been Bradley Beach ever since. Of course, you won't find many traces of the towns as Bradley set them up. Like many of the shore resorts, Asbury Park had a building boom in the Roaring Twenties. The eight-story Berkeley Carteret Hotel opened in 1924, named after the first owners of New Jersey, and designed by the New York firm of Warren and Wetmore, best known for designing New York City's Grand Central Terminal. They also designed the Paramount Theater and Convention Hall complex straddling the boardwalk. This opened up near the end of the 1920s, has recently been restored with new shops and restaurants inside, outdoor dining areas. Outside of the convention hall, you'll see this plaque remembering the 137 passengers and crew members who died in September of 1934 after a fire broke out aboard an ocean liner called the Morrow Castle which was making an overnight run back to New York from Havana. By then, ships carried enough lifeboats that everybody should have been able to get off safely, but the fire spread so quickly, most people couldn't get to the boats, and they were just jumping into the ocean. Stormy weather eventually drove the ship aground right off the Asbury Park Beach, just north of the con convention hall. You can see a little bit of it to the right side of this old postcard. She then remained there, stuck in the sand, until March 1935, when they towed it away and cut it up for scrap. Before that, as you can see on this old postcard, large crowds would gather on the beach or the boardwalk just to get a look at the burned-out shipwreck. And some of the business people in Asbury Park wasted no time cashing in on this. The copy I have of this postcard was originally mailed about a week after the ship ran aground. 
You can also find traces of the 1920s building boom at the south end of the boardwalk, overlooking Wesley Lake, which separates Asbury from Ocean Grove. The round building with the green roof was the Carousel House. No carousel any longer. They sometimes use it as a theater, sometimes as an art gallery. The large building behind that was called the Casino, when that didn't necessarily refer to a gambling place. And the building with the tower. Well, that was a heating plant for other buildings on the boardwalk. The pipes ran from there underneath the boards all the way up to the convention hall. It's also a reminder that although most of Asbury's seasonal workforce was African American, the beaches were segregated until the late 1940s, and that limited the blacks to the small one closed in on three sides by buildings and piers. They also had to use separate concessions in the base of that heating plant. Heading south from Ocean Grove and Bradley Beach, we pass through Avon by the Sea, named after the town in England where Shakespeare lived. But on the Jersey Shore, the area's first big property owner thought this would be a good place to grow tobacco and manufacture cigars. Luckily, his business partners talked him into starting a resort instead. And then if we cross the drawbridge over Shark River Inlet, drive down through Belmar, beautiful sea in French, we come to one of the prettiest towns on the shore. The Spring Lake Oceanfront used to be lined with giant grand hotels, built in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Only one is still standing. It opened in 1914 and was named for the streets on either side. They called it the Essex and Sussex Hotel. Well, the hotel closed in 1985. The building then sat empty for about 15 years, and it really looked like we were going to lose this landmark. But it was fully refurbished in 2000 and reopened as a condominium, so still there. Spring Lake also has one of my favorite non-commercial boardwalks, simply a place where you can go for a nice long walk and actually see and hear the ocean. Next town south of there has the last live-in lighthouse built on the shore. The Seagirt Light was built in 1896 to mark a small inlet. Well, by the 1940s, ocean tides had filled that inlet with sand. So the Coast Guard shut the light down in 1955, gave the building to the town, which used it first as a library and community center, and then in the early 1980s restored it as a historical museum, usually open Sunday afternoons in the summertime. Across the Manasquan Inlet, you'll wind up in Point Pleasant Beach, which has one of the state's last commercial fishing fleets, as well as a boardwalk I remember visiting many times as a child. These homes along the northern stretch probably started a lifelong dream of living on the boardwalk like that. Now, the Point Pleasant boardwalk uh, was first built in 1880. 1928, a man named Charles Jenkinson built a boardwalk pavilion there. He had started his career running a soda fountain in Asbury Park. By the 1930s, he had added a dance hall and a miniature golf course. It was his son Orlo who added kiddie rides and a miniature train on the beach in the 1940s. What many people don't know is that the Jenkinson family sold these businesses in the 1970s, but the current owners have kept the name because it is practically synonymous with Point Pleasant Beach. The town is the northernmost on a long, narrow strip of land called the Barnegat Peninsula. That also includes Lavalette, Ocean Beach, Ortley Beach, Seaside Heights. Seaside Heights was a little late getting into the boardwalk game. They opened the first one there in 1921. The famous Sky Ride was added later. The famous wooden carousel there was carved in 1910. 58 hand-carved wooden animals created by two of the master carousel carvers, William Denzel and Charles Loof. It was moved to Casino Pier in Seaside in 1930. Unfortunately, it's currently in storage. It's now owned by the city, and eventually they'll build it a new home out on the boardwalk. The great amusement piers were built up after World War II, when the Garden State Parkway and other new highways made the shore more accessible to day trippers. Unfortunately, Seaside was one of the towns hit hardest by Superstorm Sandy in October 2012, so those piers were completely destroyed. The boardwalk has been bouncing back, there are new attractions out on the beach, but this probably should remind us that the ocean is still more powerful than we are. And out on those islands, or peninsulas, you're literally building your castles on sand. At a time when these storms may be becoming more frequent or stronger, sea levels are rising, 
and this is not news. It's happened before. If you don't remember Beach Haven at the south end of Long Beach Island having a mile-long boardwalk, that's because it was torn apart by the hurricane of September 1944. And instead of rebuilding that boardwalk, the town sold all of the wood they salvaged to Atlantic City, which also needed to rebuild. That same storm swept away the last houses in the town of South Cape May, leaving only St. Mary's by the sea, or the convent as some visitors call it. <clears throat> And when that was built in the 1880s as the Shoreham Hotel, it was a mile from the water. This picture shows you what beach erosion can do, <clears throat> and it's threatened again. But even without major storms, the tides and the currents are forever shifting the sand up and down the beaches, and almost any attempt we can make to interfere with that will have unintended consequences. These stone jetties are built along the shore to trap the shifting sand, but in reality it just causes the sand to build up on one side while the beach on the other side withers away. And in the early 1900s, solutions like this caused an entire island to wash away. This is a replica of the Tucker's Island Lighthouse. It was built around 2000 as part of the Tuckered and Seaport Museum. Now, why did we need a replica? Well, Tucker's Island, or Tucker's Beach, was at the south end of Long Beach Island, was one of the shore's earliest resorts. By the 1880s, had three hotels, small colony of summer homes, there was a life-saving station, there was a lighthouse. But in February of 1920, a storm reopened the old inlet, separating Tucker's Island from Long Beach. To protect the beaches at Beach Haven, jetties were built out, and those redirected the shifting sand in such a way that Tucker's Island began washing away. The ocean undermined the lighthouse and it collapsed in 1927. The keeper had been on duty until that very day. And by the 1950s, the entire island had disappeared beneath the waves. And to this day, the best way we know of protecting development along the shores is just maintaining large systems of dunes. On a lighter note, a long-ago storm surge may help to explain the name of a favorite Jersey Shore treat, because saltwater taffy generally contains neither salt nor water. It's mostly sugar and cornstarch. But there's an old Atlantic City story that after a storm flooded a candy shop, the owner advertised his surviving inventory as saltwater taffy. And his customers were so curious about this new concoction that it sold out in record time and the name is stuck to the present day. Anyway, south of Seaside you'll find the longest stretch of undeveloped coastline in New Jersey, 10 miles of beaches and dunes known as Island Beach State Park. Great place to go to escape the commotion of the boardwalk towns, or just to see what our shore was like before it was so heavily developed. Just one road running down the center of Island Beach, drive to the end of that road, walk from there to the southern tip of the peninsula, and you can look across the Barnegat Inlet at the Barnegat Lighthouse. Old Barney, built in 1859, still in use, and actually has its own state park on the other side at the north end of Long Beach Island. The, uh, the state park includes the island's last patch of coastal forest, and it's protected by a stone jetty about a quarter of a mile long. This is the view from out on the jetty looking back at the park. The name Barnegat comes from a Dutch phrase that meant the Inlet of Breakers, which is what a sea captain, Cornelius Jacobson May, called it in the early 1600s. He also named the southern tip of our state after himself, and that's still called Cape May. Barnegat is one of three New Jersey lighthouses designed or supervised by an 1835 West Point graduate and military engineer. His name was George Gordon Meade. If you know his name, it's probably because he also led the Union Army at the Battle of Gettysburg in 1863. The first of the three New Jersey lighthouses that he designed is the Absecon Light. That was completed in 1857 and stands about two blocks from the boardwalk in Atlantic City. It's now the centerpiece of Lighthouse Park, which runs right through the middle of the city, and is the oldest building in Atlantic City. 
At 170 feet, it's also the tallest lighthouse in New Jersey, the third tallest masonry lighthouse in the United States. And if you stop in for a visit, they have reopened for tours, and they're generally open almost every day of the year. They don't leave a lot of doubt about this. Those spiral steps are numbered. So when you get to the top, you know you've climbed all 228 of them. And if you had been the lighthouse keeper, your climbing wasn't done at that point. They had to climb another dozen steps in a ladder to actually get to the lantern room. Because the light is still in operation, the lantern is closed to visitors. Meade also supervised the design of the lighthouse in Cape May Point State Park. That was completed in 1859, same year as Old Barney, and also still in use. There's 199 steps in this spiral stairway, and when you get to the top, you can look up into the lantern room. You'll see a rotating electric arrow beacon, and that makes a flashing light. I can remember vacationing in Wildwood Crest. If you walk out on the beach after dark, look to the south, you'll see this light flash once every 15 seconds. The original lens is, was removed in the 1940s. That's now displayed at the Cape May County Museum. That's on Route 9, right across from the Cape May County Zoo, which is also well worth a visit if you happen to be in the area. So why so many lighthouses on the Jersey Shore? Well, it was a very heavily traveled, traveled stretch of coastline. All of that shipping traffic heading in and out of New York and Delaware Bay heading up to Philadelphia or other industrial cities along there. And storms were wrecking so many ships on the empty beaches that sailors called this the graveyard of the Atlantic. Most of the coast wasn't really inhabited until well into the 20th century. So after dark, these lighthouses were the only sign you had that you were getting close to land. During the daytime, sailors could also use the patterns and colors of the towers to figure out where they were along the coast. But even with the lighthouses, storms, or even just in bad weather, ships continued to run aground. The Fortuna grounded on Long Beach Island in 1910. Everybody made it safely ashore. But about a hundred years earlier, another ship grounded on almost the same spot. And that one wasn't even noticed until the morning after it grounded. It was first spotted by a captain sailing out of Tuckerton. As he was passing Long Beach Island, he saw just the overturned hull of a ship washed up on the beach. He went ashore and rescued the one survivor that he found. Now, I've never seen the name of that ship or the captain or the survivor, but because of that overturned hull, they've called that part of the island Ship Bottom ever since. And right in front of their town hall, you can still see the anchor from the Fortuna, as well as this tile mosaic. And I have to admit, strange, tam strange town names like that were one of the things that started me researching the history of the shore. Because I cannot drive through a town called Ship Bottom and not wonder what they were thinking. Another of the island's towns owes its name to the United States Life Saving Service which was founded by the U.S. Treasury Department in the 1870s to rescue sailors and passengers after shipwrecks. These service-built stations like this all along our sea coasts, one about every three to five miles. The first floor was the boathouse where they stored all of their equipment. Upstairs you had living quarters for up to eight men. And there was always a watchtower so that the captain of the station could see for miles along the ocean, could watch for ships that might be sailing too close to shore, might be in danger of running aground. They would try to warn those ships with flags or after dark with lanterns or flares. Every night, two men at a time would leave the station to patrol the beach, one walking north, one walking south. And each morning, the entire crew would practice launching these surf boats. And they would practice in almost any weather. But if it was too stormy to get to a ship even in these boats, they would use a small cannon to shoot a rope out to the ship. And then with a system of pulleys, they'd send out what they called the breeches buoy. Nothing fancy, nothing high-tech. This was a life-saving ring with a pair of canvas shorts sewn into it, designed to bring one person at a time back to shore. Winslow Homer made it a little more dramatic in this painting. They also had something called a life car, this was also hung from the ropes. It was watertight, held five or six people at a time. So once the life-saving service was well established, hardly any lives were lost along our coasts to shipwrecks. 
The service no longer exists, at least not under its original name. In 1915, it was combined with the old Revenue Cutter Service to form the United States Coast Guard. Since the late 1930s, the Coast Guard has also operated all of our lighthouses. Now, all of the life-saving stations were numbered, but they were also usually named after the nearest town. Well, that was a problem on Long Beach Island. They needed a station every few miles. Most of the island wasn't really developed until the middle of the 20th century. So as they were building one of the stations, there was no nearby town to name it after. The sign at the nearest railroad stop identified an old hotel. It said Clubhouse. Down at the Treasury, they didn't think that was a good name for the new life-saving station. So they took another look at the map. And in the bay behind Long Beach were some smaller islands. Some of those were named after the people who owned them, including a Thomas Lovelady. So they called it the Lovelady's Island Life-Saving Station, and when the developers showed up in the 1940s, that's where the town of Lovelady's got her name from. As for nearby Harvey Cedars, the story used to be told that the town was named after Daniel Harvey, a hermit who lived in a stand of cedars that's long ago vanished. Well, most historians do not believe that Daniel Harvey ever existed. They traced the name back to some early advertisements for the island, on which that stretch was described as Harvest Cedars. And somewhere along the way, Harvest was shortened to Harvey. The island's busiest resort has always been Beach Haven, near the southern end. That's where you'll still find most of the shops and restaurants and attractions, as including the Long Beach Island Museum. Building was built in 1882 as Holy Innocence Episcopal Church, converted to a museum in 1976. Also in the late 1800s, when two large hotels opened up down there, the Engleside was the first in 1876, named after its owner, Robert Engel. This one was demolished in 1943. By then, it had already been sitting empty for several years. It seems they had lost a lot of their business to the Baldwin Hotel, which had opened up in 1883. The same family ran the Baldwin Locomotive Works out in Pennsylvania. One of the reasons that the Engleside may have been losing business to the Baldwin was that the Engleside was owned by Quakers who would not allow alcohol to be sold on the premises, while the Baldwin had the most popular bar on the entire island. Because of the turrets on top of the towers, this building was later nicknamed Dracula's Castle, and it burned down in 1960. A lot of the 19th century ocean resorts, including Beach Haven, were either founded or developed by the railroads, by the owners or the investors. Of course, when the first railroad was built to the Jersey Shore, it opened up in 1854 and was called the Camden and Atlantic, a lot of people thought those investors had lost their minds. They told them, you're building a railroad to nowhere. And they were. Their destination was a place called Absecon Island. That was the old native name for it. There were a few houses on the bay shore, not much of anything else. But if you drew a straight line across, from New, Jer across New Jersey from Philadelphia to the Atlantic Ocean, this was the shortest practical route. And Jonathan Pitney wasn't worried. He was one of the backers of the railroad. And out on the island, he started a little town that you may have heard of. Oh, within a few years, Atlantic City had some of the biggest and best hotels on the shore, and within a few decades, it even had three competing railroads out to that island. The Baltimore and Ohio never went there. That was added to the Monopoly board because the board had four sides, and they wanted a railroad on each one. Pitney originally advertised Atlantic City as a health resort because in his day, people believed that ocean air could cure you of anything. Doctors used to prescribe visits to the Jersey Shore. Still wonder how that note went over when you handed it in at work or at school. But people would take a morning walk or an evening walk to breathe in the ocean air. Mostly stayed out of the afternoon sunlight. Coming home with a suntan wouldn't become fashionable until maybe the 1920s. But those morning and evening walks quickly became a problem for the hotel owners. People were tracking a little too much beach back inside with them. So, in 1870, the hotel owners got together to solve the problem. They built the first Atlantic City boardwalk, which looked nothing like the one on the screen. It laid flat on the sand, it was only a few feet wide, and it was built in sections. 
Every September, they'd take it apart, put it in storage, bring it out next year. Uh, they didn't build a permanent boardwalk until the early 1880s. These early boardwalks also did not have any shops, restaurants, amusement parks, hotels, or casinos, although that did begin changing in the 1890s. Legal gambling arrived in Atlantic City in the 1970s. The other kind had been there all along. But long before that, the boardwalk was world famous for its ocean piers. One of the first opened in 1886 as the Iron Pier. If anybody still remembers it, you probably know it by its later name of Heinz Pier, which was used by its owners to advertise pickles and ketchup and whatever made up the rest of the 57 varieties. This pier was another victim of the September 1944 hurricane. You also had George Tillieu's Steeplechase. Steeplechase was nicknamed the Funny Place because he had all sorts of gadgets and gizmos set up that could make you look or feel rather ridiculous. That was apparently part of the fun. In fact, if you really wanted to get into the spirit, they would rent you a clown costume to wear while you were there. One of Atlantic City's most famous businessmen in the early 1900s was named John Lake Young, or Captain Young is the way he liked to be addressed by visitors. And he started out as a carpenter, claimed to have helped build the first Atlantic City boardwalks. He later bought a carousel and made so much money with that that by the early 1900s he was building an ocean pier. And he told everybody that pier was costing him a million dollars. So when he opened it up in 1905, he called it the Million Dollar Pier. And he installed the latest rides and attractions, booked the most popular bands and entertainers. Harry Houdini used to perform there. But Captain Young didn't just run the pier or book the entertainment. For the last 30 summers of his life, he lived on the Million Dollar Pier. He designed this house himself. Sadly, it's no longer standing. A newspaper reporter once described it as full of marble, some of it real. He liked to fish from the end of the pier, or from his kitchen window, that's what he would tell visitors. And he got the post office to give him a rather unusual mailing address. You could reach him at number one, Atlantic Ocean, which is still the official address for this pier. Back in the 80s and 90s, when it looked like an ocean liner, they called it Ocean One. Since the turn of this century, it's been a shopping mall, which has had several names over the years. Probably the most famous of the Atlantic City piers opened in 1898. The steel pier quickly became known as the showplace of the nation, with its theaters, movies, concerts, high-diving horses. General Motors had an exhibit in there for decades. Sadly, this pier was closed in 1976 and mostly destroyed by a fire in the 1980s. So there is still a steel pier in Atlantic City. Today, it's just an ordinary amusement park. Like Asbury Park, Atlantic City had its building boom in the 1920s. The place was already known for giant hotels like the Traymore. That was finished in 1915, but demolished in the 1970s to make room for the modern hotel casino towers. But it was the 24-story Claridge that was first advertised as a skyscraper by the sea. Unfortunately, a lot of these buildings opened up just in time for the stock market crash. And during the Second World War, even the fanciest of these hotels were converted to military hospitals or even barracks. Convention Hall also opened in 1929. Boardwalk Hall, they call it today. So big that during World War II, the Army Air Force used it as a training center. They actually practiced the Normandy landings on the Atlantic City beaches. This is also where a lot of Miss Americas were crowned although the pageant was first held in September of 1921, on the weekend after Labor Day. It was basically a scheme by the Atlantic City Businessmen's League to extend the summer season by a week. And it worked. They got 100,000 spectators that year. The first winner was Margaret Gorman from Washington, D.C., 16 years old. And then Mary Campbell from Ohio. She's the only contestant who ever won more than once, 1922 and 1923. For the first few years, Miss America received her crown from King Neptune himself. Okay, actually author and inventor Hudson Maxim, who also had a big estate up on Lake Patcong. But it was not all fun and games in Atlantic City in the 1920s. There are a lot of inlets and bays along the Jersey Shore, and today they're mostly used for pleasure boating. 
but some of them have played big roles in our history. In colonial days, pirates hid in the shallows, where the British warships couldn't reach them. So all along the Jersey Shore, there are stories and rumors of buried treasure. The good news? If you're looking for it, nobody's found it yet. During the Revolution and the War of 1812, American privateers would attack British merchant ships and even warships from these inlets. And in the 1920s, a lot of them were infested with bootleggers. When Congress passed the 18th Amendment in 1919, outlawing the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages, our territorial limit was just three miles offshore. So foreign ships quickly lined up right outside the limit, and anybody with a sturdy boat could race out to what they called Rum Row and buy whatever they needed, and then race back to shore. Well, Congress solved that problem. They moved the territorial limit out to 12 miles. But people still wanted to drink. So that's when the New York and Chicago gangsters took over distribution. And they practically ran Atlantic City until the law was repealed in December of 1933. This is a rather infamous newspaper photograph from 1929 showing Al Capone walking on the Atlantic City boardwalk with the Atlantic County treasurer and political boss, Enoch Johnson, known to friends and enemies alike as Nucky. He arranged deals with all of the bootleggers, made sure that he got a cut of every sale. There was a popular book about Johnson a few years ago called Boardwalk Empire, that inspired a very fictionalized television series that ran for five seasons on HBO. Nucky lived until 1968, but his influence did begin crumbling when Prohibition was repealed, and he spent the first half of the 1940s in federal prison for tax evasion. But it is true that in the 1920s he did run his empire from the ninth floor of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel, which is still standing. It's now an oceanfront condominium. If you don't recognize this picture, it's because the hotel that they use on the television show was actually modeled after the earlier Marlboro Blenheim, which was built around 1906 and was the first reinforced concrete building on the boardwalk. It was also demolished in the 1970s. And the entire show was shot out in Brooklyn. Now, Jersey Shore property may be worth a fortune today, but that was not always the case. There was a time you could barely give it away. So as popular as Atlantic City was, as late as 1880, most of Absecon Island was still undeveloped. So in 1880, a developer named James Lafferty from Philadelphia bought property in what was then called South Atlantic City. To attract buyers to what seemed like the middle of nowhere, he could have put ads in the newspaper or set up a billboard. Instead, he built a 60-foot tall wooden elephant, covered it with tin plating, painted it white, but you could see his white elephant for miles. You could see it from Atlantic City, you could see it out on the ocean, you could see it across the bay. He had stairs in the back leg so you could climb up inside. Once you were in there, another set of steps led to a sort of pavilion up top. From there you could see all the land he had for sale. And he was hoping that while you were there you would see the perfect spot to build your summer home and then rush to his sales office, which was conveniently located inside the elephant's head. The two little round windows were the eyes. Only one problem. Early 1880s, nobody wanted a summer home in South Atlantic City. The railroad didn't go there yet. There were no good roads to that part of the island yet. So by 1887, Lafferty was deeply in debt. To get out, he had to sell all of his property very cheaply just to pay off the debts. Sold the elephant to John and Sophia Gertson, husband and wife. They ran it as a tourist attraction for several decades. Ten cents a tour. One day, somebody asked them about the elephant, and Sophia said, Lucy, she's been in the family for years. Never did say where she got the name from. Lafferty had not named the elephant. But after the Gertsons, Lucy sat empty for quite a long time, and by the 1960s was in such bad shape, her neighbors were calling her Lucy the Eyesore and demanding that she be demolished. Well, there was another group of people in the area. By now, the property had become the towns of Ventnor and Margate, and there was a group in Margate who started a committee to save Lucy. They raised money, they had to get her a new piece of land, but even in this condition they were able to raise the entire elephant onto a specially built flatbed with which they towed her 
two blocks through town to her new home, where she was fully restored inside and out, been there ever since as a museum, tourist attraction, national landmark. The property also includes a restaurant and a gift shop. And this was not the only unusual sales office built on the Jersey Shore. Believe it or not, in 1884, another developer built an elephant in South Cape May. That one also failed to sell property and was knocked down just a few years, years later. And in 1926, a developer in Brigantine, that's the island just north of Atlantic City, built himself this sales office. Of course, the business collapsed during the Depression, so this later served as a police station. To contact the cars out on patrol, they'd turn the light on at the top of the tower. And then it was used as a gift shop. That also didn't go so well, because if you've been to Brigantine, you'll know this tower stands on a traffic circle in the middle of the island's busiest intersection. It was never an official lighthouse, never used to guide ships, but it has been restored over the years. They do light it every night. Continuing south from Atlantic City, one of my favorite towns along the shore advertises itself as America's greatest family resort. And Ocean City was inspired by Ocean Grove, also started out as a camp meeting town. This one started by the Lake family out of Pleasantville. And they were farmers, preachers, land speculators, inventors. Simon Lake was only in his teens when his grandfather and his uncle started the city in 1879, but he already knew what he wanted to do with his life, because a few years earlier he had read one of my favorite books, Jules Verne, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. And he was very impressed with Captain Nemo's submarine, the Nautilus, but thought that he might improve on the design, and spent the rest of his life working on that. So successfully that during World War I, he got a contract from the U.S. Navy to build attack submarines. I last visited Ocean City this past October, got there just in time to see a jeep parade on the boardwalk. Along the boardwalk you'll find the Music Pier where they hold their summer concerts. This is another boardwalk that was largely built up in the 1920s, mainly because many of the older buildings were were destroyed by a fire in 1927. Three years later, a man named David Gillian opened his first amusement park on the boardwalk. In the 1950s, his son opened Wonderland Pier, and you can see that Ferris wheel from the Garden State Parkway. In 1972, the Gillian family, which still runs the amusement parks and a lot of other boardwalk attractions, brought in this 1926 carousel. At the moment, it is the only antique hand-carved carousel in operation on the shore. Most newer ones just have fiberglass animals. Charles Landis was the founder of the city of Vineland in South Jersey, but he also started Sea Isle City in 1880. Of course, his original plan was to create an American Venice with canals instead of streets. By 1885, the Sea Isle City Improvement Corporation was building a much more traditional beach town. From there, you'll pass through Avalon and Stone Harbor on the way to one of the shore's most popular destinations. A little hard to believe it today, but the name Wildwoods? That was once an accurate description of what they called Five Mile Island or Five Mile Beach. Until the early 1900s, most of the island was covered with thick forests. The first Wildwood boardwalk opened in 1895, and the modern one? Watch the tram car, please. That's two miles long. Maury's amusement piers have been built up since the early 1970s. I love to photograph those from the boardwalk or from the beach just after dark. But the island's first resort was started about a century before that, early 1870s. And it was on the bay side of what's now North Wildwood, a little place called Anglesey, which is also where the Federal Lighthouse Board built the Hereford Inlet Lighthouse in 1874. Still in operation, been a museum since the 1980s, as so you can see what it would be like to live or work at one of those lighthouses. Of course, the Wildwoods as we know them today are largely a product of the mid-20th century. During the Depression, when most people couldn't afford to travel, a lot of the rail lines to the shore were shut down, the tracks were removed and sold for scrap. So when people began traveling again after World War II, if you wanted to go to the Jersey Shore, you had to drive. And that could be a long trip winding backwoods highways, driving through cities and towns. Things began to change when the parkway opened in 55, 
And this is when people discovered that there was a lot more to the shore than just Atlantic City, Asbury Park, Long Branch, all of which were starting to show their age. Uh, of course, it also kicked off a building boom that still shows no signs of slowing down. In the wild woods, it gave us miles of colorful motels with exotic names, make you feel like you're traveling the world without leaving that island, many of them decorated with fake palm trees, neon signs. So by the turn of this century, was that really 20 years ago? Local business people had nicknamed the architectural style after the pop music of the 50s and 60s. They call this doo-wop architecture. Of course, if you're taking the parkway south, to get to our last stop, you have to take exit zero. That is what the sign says. But people have been visiting Cape May since long before the parkway, long before the railroads. Cape May has been welcoming summer visitors since the 1690s. In those days, mostly people coming up from the southern colonies. So the town has some of the shore's oldest hotels. Thomas Hughes opened one in 1816 that was so big his neighbors and rivals, they laughed at him. They told him he'd never earn his money back. They nicknamed it Tommy's Folly. If you think that's bad, he called it the Big House. Luckily, he was elected to Congress in the 1820s. That's when he renamed the place Congress Hall. Now, it's true that his original wooden building burned in 1878, but it was rebuilt of brick in time for the following season. Been there ever since. John Philip Sousa named one of his first marches after the Congress Hall, and at least four different presidents have stayed there, including Grant. Benjamin Harrison even nicknamed it his Summer White House in 1890. The Chalfont opened in 1876, a few blocks from Congress Hall. It's been enlarged a couple of times since then. And the Inn was built in 1894, advertised as one of the city's first year-round hotels, complete with gas lighting and steam heat in every room. Like most places, Cape May has some rather strange history. In 1905, 20,000 people gathered on the beach to watch an auto race. Two of the drivers that day were Louis Chevrolet and Henry Ford. Ford came in last. And off of Sunset Beach, you can still see the remains of the Atlantis. This was a prototype cargo ship made during World War I, made out of reinforced concrete. Well, only a dozen of them were ever completed, and not a single one of them was launched before the war ended in 1918. So, a few of them had brief careers as freighters or oil tankers, several were lost in storms or collisions, and the rest of them were mothballed. 1926, a company called National Navigation down in Baltimore bought the Atlantis, towed it to Cape May, and they were planning to use it as part of a ferry dock to start a service to southern Delaware. But before they could get the ship into position, a storm blew in, broke the mooring lines, and drove the Atlantis into the shallows where she stuck in the sand. Concrete ship stuck in the sand, there is no moving it. They tried. Although there's not much to see anymore, Back in the 30s and 40s, when you could still see the entire ship, local businesses used the sides as billboards. First company to do that was selling boat insurance. A little late for National Navigation, they went bankrupt, so the ferry service didn't begin until the 1960s. On the beach in Cape May Point State Park, near the lighthouse, you can see the remains of a concrete gun battery built during World War II to defend the entrance to Delaware Bay. If an enemy fleet approached, the guns would have been aimed using sightings from a line of watchtowers that stretched from North Wildwood to Bethany Beach down in Delaware. This one near Cape May Point has been preserved as a World War II memorial and museum. There's a spiral stairway to the top. And like most towns, Cape May has changed over the years. I took this picture of the old Christian Admiral Hotel in the summer of 95. It was demolished the following year. There are houses there now. And you may remember the old convention hall on the boardwalk with David Dunleavy's Mural of Wales overlooking the beach. The replacement opened in May of 2012. But Cape May has also held on to a lot of its past. So you've got shops and restaurants in the old buildings on Washington Street, which has been closed to pedestrian, or closed to auto traffic to create a pedestrian mall. And in the 1970s, the entire city of Cape May was named a National Landmark District, 
which has helped to preserve hundreds of the Victorian homes and cottages, bed and breakfast inns and hotels. Also brings us to the end of our tour of the Jersey Shore. Since we started out with a sunrise over the Atlantic, might as well close with a sunset on the bay. This is the view from Wildwood Crest. If you visit my website, kevinweiss.com, you'll find a full schedule of when I'm speaking and which topics I'll be speaking about. Ordinarily, I'd also add where I'm speaking, but it does look like for at least the rest of the summer, if not the rest of the year, I'll be doing all of my talks from right here in my basement in Lyndhurst. You can also follow me on Facebook at Kevin Weiss Author or on Instagram at Kevin Weiss. Also on the website, you can find information and links for the books that I've written and illustrated, including Jersey Shore History and Facts, more New Jersey history and New Jersey State Parks. And a couple of years ago, I wrote about my favorite Christmas stories and traditions and songs in Santa's hometown. They're all available, both paperback and ebook editions. If you have got any questions, I'll do my best to try and answer those. using either if you want to unmute your microphones or using the chat box. Um, I can do it either way. Did we have any questions? If not,